Thanks for inviting me, you. I'm gonna talk about the work that we've been doing, developing algorithms for X-ray crystallography at Berkeley Lab, and we're collaborating um, in the Exascale Computing Project with the light source, the X-ray free electron light source at the Stanford Linear Accelerator. Um, this is going to be strictly a science talk, no GPU implementation. However, the, next, the very next talk by Johannes Block is gonna talk about how we implement this. So going on to the science, uh, next slide, please. Um, so the, the, the title of the talk is about new protein science. So what's the old protein science? And that is that for 50 years, we've been determining um, uh, structures of proteins and their open access in the protein data bank using X-ray crystallography. So diffraction from perhaps a single crystal that we perform at a, at a synchrotron X-ray source. So one crystal on a goniometer rotating in a beam and uh, producing a series of different diffraction patterns. Um, uh, but for the past 10 years, we've been using a very different and much more intense X-ray light source where all the X-rays are compressed into 30 femtoseconds. This actually destroys the crystal, um, but not until a diffraction pattern is recorded. And therefore, and we only get a, a partial diffraction pattern there. So we have to do, uh, an experiment where we examine and sequence, you know, perhaps a half a million crystals uh, in random orientations and piece together the diffraction pattern from there. And that's why this is now becoming an exascale problem and of course requiring GPUs. But we're, we're relatively new uh, as a field in implementing GPUs and I think you'll appreciate that from the talk. So let's go on to the next uh, slide, please. Um, Waiting for, yes, thank you. Uh, so I'm gonna give you an example of uh, a protein structure that we're looking at in photosynthesis, um, photosystem two. You'll remember from biology that this is the, uh, the protein that's responsible for accepting four photons from sunlight and using that to split waters and evolving molecular oxygen. In so doing, the hydrogen release is uh, put into chemical energy in the form of ATP and the high energy electrons are then used for carbon fixation. But we are focusing on, uh, in, a particular, in this particular case, on the cofactor, which is four manganese atoms coupled with bridging oxygens and a calcium. Next slide, please. So why would a system like this um, require uh, this very bright XFEL uh, light source? And, that, and it all has to do with radiation damage. We're interested in following the time progress of a redox reaction. However, any exposure to X-rays will reduce the manganese to manganese two. So the very thing that we're interested in studying is destroyed by the X-rays. And that's why we need a 30 femtosecond source to actually get the diffraction pattern before damage processes come in. The second reason is to look at, of course, the time domain. We're gonna be putting uh, exciting the system with four photons taken from a green laser, sort of at a, a millisecond repeat. And we're gonna be probing many time points in between those laser flashes to see how the system evolves. And in order to do this, we have to do the ex entire experiment under physiological temperatures, which we can't do. But as you see, we're very concerned with the X-ray damage um, possibility. So in order to control for that, we're actually simultaneously looking at the K-beta emission line from manganese. So this is an X-ray emission line um, that changes ever so slightly uh, because it's coupled to the valence state of the manganese. Let's, let's show how on the next slide, how that comes off in practice in an experiment. So in the very uh, lower left corner, we are streaming you know, half a million crystals into the X-rays in rapid succession. At the same time, we're exciting the crystals one by one um, with laser pulses, perhaps one, two, three, and four laser pulses in order to um, move them around the redox cycle. We are collecting diffraction patterns in this gray detector, but at right angles to that, this yellow X-ray, uh, this is an X-ray emission spectrometer where we're, um, we're actually recording this uh, this emission spectrum, and we're, we're seeing very small milli-electron volt changes in the X-ray emission spectrum that tell us that after the first flash, we oxidize, after the second flash, we oxidize, 
And after the third flash, we're actually forming that OO double bond, generating the molecular oxygen, and we're reducing the manganesis again. But the very thing, we, we, because of spectral overlap, we cannot tell the individual charge states of individual manganese atoms, which is what we're very interested in. So I'll circle back at the end of the talk how we're going to address that. In the meantime, let's advance to uh, the next slide, please. And just show, so after eight years of working on this system, we've gotten um, some results, very, uh, uh, but there's a lot of stuff that we still need to know. So if you'll go down, down to where I have the S3 label, this shows um, that after two photons excitation, the manganese is in purple, this is uh, number one and four, move apart about 2.2 angstroms and allow this new oxygen atom, oxygen X, to come in. And it looks like it's in position to form the double bond to O5. And so we have uh, an idea of what's happening, but there's many more time points that need to be um, addressed. And so now I'm gonna shift focus on the next slide and talk about why this is a computational problem. Um, just to show you, this is a diffraction pattern. Um, you know, the, the normal analysis is that we look at Bragg spots and we measure the number of photons in each Bragg spot. Now, there's a distinction to be had here between a Bragg spot, which is observing photons on an image, and structure factors, which become the coefficients in a Fourier transform that yield us the electron density. And I would love to tell you that the Bragg spot is the same as the structure factor amplitude, but it's not, it's not really. Um, and I'll show why in the next couple of slides. In the meantime, I, I, it's all a matter of accuracy. And there are two reasons maybe for wanting high accuracy. Um, as you see um, in this kind of gray diffraction pattern in the back, as you go out to a higher angle, um, the diffraction spots become weaker. So we're actually trying to measure small changes in very weak Bragg spots. And secondly, if you just think about it, we're looking at one oxygen atom in a very large molecular complex of maybe 46 polypeptide chains. So we really want 1% accuracy in these uh, intensity measurements. And this is why instead of the traditional um, analysis pattern that's maybe a terascale computation, where we just sum up the photons in each Bragg spot, we're moving instead to a, 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 fit, a, a profile model where we fit the structure factors to the Bragg spots as if they were unknown parameters. Um, so I'll show on the next slide, um, you know, why uh, the traditional uh, procedure, the, the terascale procedure fails and we're moving to exascale use. This is just uh, what you know from a physics class about X-ray diffraction from planes of atoms in a crystal. And due to Bragg's law, you get a reflection at a specific angle. But what we've known for 100 years or so is that it's not a, a delta function. There's actually a width um, to, this, uh, to the observa observation of a Bragg spot. So if you're rotating the crystal, the Bragg spot uh, flashes on and then it goes off slowly. Uh, with a certain angular width. This is called the rocking curve. And we don't really know the, the, the shape of this function. It's a, it's a parameter. It's, it's due to the underlying mosaic uh, disorder of the crystal. The second reason why the profile modeling becomes difficult on, this, on the next slide, please, is, um, is that the X-ray spectrum at the, the, the light source is slightly broadband. It's spiky and it's stochastic, so we can measure it differently for every pulse. But uh, if you think about a Bragg spot that, you know, on this right side, there's an experimental Bragg spot, but this is really composed of photons of different energies. So the red photons produce this little red fringe on the second panel, and the blue photons produce a blue fringe. And what, when we're modeling the Bragg spot, we add up all these fringes from diff different X-ray energies to produce a physics model of the Bragg spot that we then compare with the experimental model. And this is just shown in an equation down here. Uh, the pixel intensity is really a sum over wavelength channels, 
where the coefficients are the spectral intensities that we measure. And then the big unknown in yellow is the structure factor. That's where, what we're treating as an unknown quantity. And the third uh, factor is simply due to the rocking curve that I showed on the last slide. So let's go on to um, the next slide, please. Uh, so what we're really doing here is we're producing a large Bayesian model. So we're saying we, um, you know, we have a model, physics-based model, where we predict that there's perhaps 10 photons on this pixel, but we only observe eight. So what's the probability of that? And then we do iterative first derivative parameter optimization to maximize the um, Bayesian agreement between the model and the data. And the, the, you know, the big unknowns that we're optimizing here are the structure factor amplitudes. You know, there may be a half a million of them and any given structure factor is determined by input from hundreds of different diffraction patterns. So this is truly a global analysis of this whole very large 100 terabyte data set to get us the structure factors. So on the right side, this is just a, a simulation that show us, shows we can get to the ground truth, at least in theory. Uh, next slide. Um, I'm gonna show, uh, sorry, Hugo, can you hear me? Can you, oh, thank you. Um, so uh, here's an, a case where we hope to get some really new science out of this. I mentioned before metal atoms and different oxidation states on different atoms. We've known for a while that, for example, in this ferrodoxin protein, the electron is only carried by the red iron on top. Uh, so that's reduced. And that actually produces a different uh, absorption edge on the K X-ray absorption line between ferrous and ferric iron. This is reflected at the very bottom in the formula for the structure factor. We can actually use crystallography or crystallographic diffraction as a spectroscopic method to spatially resolve uh, the contribution of different iron at or different metal atoms in a protein one of which is reduced, one of the, which is oxidized. And on the upper right, um, I'm kind of indicating that we hope to do this with the manganese atoms in the photosystem too. On the next slide, we're just doing a simulation that shows that this sort of thing works out when we uh, model the ferrodoxin. Um, so um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna start wrapping up now. So on the next slide, um, just to mention that there are other complicating factors. We really, in order to get this last 1% of accuracy, we have to account for every single photon on the image. Here, what you're seeing is sort of a circle, um, a, a circular dark pattern that represents the solvent scattering um, it, it within in the water of solvation of the protein crystal. Um, so that is kind of a, it's, it looks like it's radially symmetric, but it's an unknown radial function form. So what we hope to do is use machine learning, perhaps the Gaussian process formalism to learn that radial uh, distribution function. There are other things, you can see that there are shadows that are actually pieces of plastic that are absorbing some photons. So we hope to use machine learning uh, to, to model these sorts of uh, artifacts. So next slide, um, it's much more than just these few artifacts. There's actually um, a phenomenon called diffuse scattering. And this reflects other correlated motions inside the crystal, such as uh, rigid body motions or independent atomic motions, lattice uh, that vibrations, uh, all of which are actually of interest biologically. For example, this new paper uh, where it really pushes this type of analysis, uh, the, the conclusions are that we can actually look at a protein and see correlated motions between the alpha and the beta domains in the protein, which is of biological interest, by looking at these halos that are sort of an extended signal in space around the Bragg spots, but not the actual Bragg spots. So uh, all of this, of course, we believe is amenable to GPU modeling. So in the end, uh, yes, thank you. <laughs> in the end, uh, we believe that in contrast to the older uh, pattern of, of data analysis where we just sum 
the photons in the Bragg spot, we can do much better by fully accounting for the Bragg spot size, shape, and intensity profile using physics models when they are known and machine learning when they are unknown. The immediate goal is to get uh, information about the, the valence state of metal atoms in proteins. And the exascale project goals is to kind of unfold this type of methodology to all X-ray crystallography beamlines. They're all user facilities. Uh, so, so that uh, any study of a metalloenzyme can benefit from this. So in the group, uh, we have Aaron Brewster and Derek Mendez and also James Holton collaborating with us um, on algorithms. And then shortly today, you'll hear from Johannes Bloch about implementation on GPU. So thanks for your attention. Thank you, Nick. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, uh, Nick uh, Nick Sauter has been a scientist at LVL since uh, 2000 and uh, working mostly on the algorithmic development for this uh, protein crystallography while the people are searching for uh, questions. So this group uh, started collaborating with NERSC in 2013, as he has shown, when it became clear that the typical diffraction data sets would start exceeding 100 terabytes. So the goal of um, their work now is to pipeline uh, this data with uh, NERSC to do offline analysis within minutes of uh, the data collection. I think uh, the, the presentation of Nick was very clear um, concerning the, the science of this, uh, this project. So do we have any question? Hugo, I'm a little worried that there's a culture gap. It seems like I'm the only talk today uh, where I'm focusing, you know, exclusively on the science application. In, the, in Kate, Kate's talk was sort of halfway there, um, but there was quite a, a, a deal of GPUs. But yeah. I think Johannes will fill the gap um, on the next talk because we do have a CUDA kernel that's at least uh, trying to do these calculations. Yeah, and I think it's really important to remind that uh, all this performance that we're trying to gain, it's in the end to make science uh, go further. So I think your, your talk uh, is really interesting and show us uh, what is behind the, the flops. And um, if we don't have a question, I had a question about the, the algorithms you're building for, the, for this science. Like, have you a thought on how to, uh, maybe to, to write this algorithm in terms of, uh, um, AX equal B in order to be able to use uh, uh, existing solver, or is this impossible in this case? Oh, you know, I think, I mean, I, I think that we are doing um, traditional parameter minimization and we've used AX plus B forms uh, where we use, uh, uh, you know, least squares or approximations. Uh, right now we're using a, a quasi-Newton uh, descent uh, LBFGS, which I think is probably well known uh, to the community here. Um, there are applications of AX plus B, but maybe not in the current work that I showed. 